Hey gum fighters. Before we get into the episode, by God's grace, set a goal. It's been over a year that I've been trying to get 10% growth a month every month. And I was told that was a pretty aggressive goal. By God's grace, we reached and exceeded that goal overall as an average. That was the goal that was set, and by God's grace, that goal was met. And I thought in my mind that as that went up, kind of congruently, that Patreon would go up as far as income goes. Well, it has not. So I'm trying to pivot and think of ways to make the podcast more profitable. Because to be honest, it's making, let's say, on average around $500 a month, which obviously is not anywhere close to a full-time income. After listening to suggestions and trying to think about some things, it was pointed out that it put out a lot of content. You know, a lot of times five or more new episodes a week. Many podcasters put out one new episode a week. So the suggestion was to put out more of that content just on Patreon to get people to go there so they're not just getting all the new content for free because then we'll see incentive to go to Patreon. I was hoping people go to Patreon mostly because they want to support the podcast. And just a value for value exchange. They value the content and my time. So they would step up and contribute. But again that hasn't really happened as much as I was hoping. So the idea here is I'll put out a reload. A tactical reload episode. And there's a bunch of new content on Patreon. I'm putting more and more new content on Patreon. Things like short video tips on how to shoot better. Video podcasts on comparing different handgun types. Even sharing like my real world GPS coordinates for bug out locations. Things like that. Not to mention being able to communicate with me and ask me questions. If you think any of that is worth a dollar. Now there are different tiers. I encourage you to give more if you think it's worth more. But I added a new tier. That was another suggestion. You can sign up for a dollar. One dollar. There should be a Patreon link in the show notes. With that, thank you. Enjoy the episode. What is going on, gunfighters? Welcome, and hopefully, welcome back to Gunfighter Life, the podcast where we talk about guns, gunfighting, use of force, ammunition, ballistics, and today, knives. The right way with God at the center, Judeo Christian values, and real world first hand experience. Now, if you only listen to Gunfighter Life, I should mention there's another podcast, Alpha Male Podcast, where I've done several episodes on knives. If this topic really interests you, maybe check that out. You can literally go to Google and type in Alpha Male Podcast Knife, and a couple of the knife episodes should pop up. They did when I did it. Or search on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you're listening. But today, we're going to focus on tactical knives. Knives for the gunfighter. You may have heard it said... Never bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, I disagree with that. I say bring both, right? Bring both. Some choices are better than others. We're going to go over that today in the episode. I'm going to put in the bio because I think it's germane to the day's topic. You've heard it many, many times. Feel free to skip ahead. But I think it's important to lay out a background and as I say in the intro, real world firsthand experience. Anyway, with that, the bio and then... By God's grace, we'll get into knives. So, who am I? Who is this person talking to you from across the internet? Why should you listen? First and foremost, I am a Christian, a servant of God, and a follower of Jesus Christ. God has blessed me to do many things in my life, for I could do nothing apart from him. U.S. Marine Corps combat veteran did a couple of tours in Iraq. As an assaultman after my combat tours, I was an urban warfare instructor for the Marine Corps under Mojave Viper. I also served in the U.S. Army, both full-time and part-time National Guard. Also did several years in law enforcement, LAPD. I worked regular assignments and more specialized assignments. I've been a private contractor for a three-letter government agency. That's all I'll say about that. I've been blessed to be a state rifle and pistol champion. And West Coast Regional Rifle Champion won more shooting competitions with the talent that God's given me than I can actually remember. 
was blessed to be the commander of a tactical team in a large metropolitan area. Our primary job, the reason we primarily existed, was to stop active shooters. I got the opportunity to head up and be the commander of that team. I grew up around guns, hunting and shooting, and competing at a very early age. I've been blessed to hunt all over this beautiful country from whitetail on the east coast to mule deer on the west coast and bear and elk and all manner of things. I've even been a professional big game hunter and guide. But again, most importantly, I'm a Christian. And I am your host, Michael Melito. Welcome to the podcast. Now I'd like to discuss tactical knives in many different roles. Military, law enforcement, CCW, personal defense, private contracting, as I have some experience in all those areas. EDC, you know, because I don't know which one's going to apply to you. And you can glean, hopefully, from all those different aspects. And also maybe we'll give a look back at history of some really good tactical knives and what you can glean from that. Also, I'm going to talk about some specific knives that I have experience with. I don't want you to focus so much on the knife and be like, oh, I'm going to go on Amazon and buy this knife. Maybe you want to. But I'd like for you more to extrapolate what that knife does, what it does well, and why it's chosen. For every one knife I mention in a certain blade length category, there may be literally a hundred. And I'm not telling you, although I do quite a bit of research, usually when I'm selecting a knife or choosing to carry one to trust my life to, that doesn't mean that my choice is the best for you. I'm not that vain or arrogant to think that I know best for you. I, I don't even know you unless you are somebody I know personally or one of the patrons. So extrapolate that information into what might work best for you. Maybe in, for instance, a really harsh maritime environment where really good stainless steel is perhaps more important to you than edge retention. Just That's just one example. So extrapolate from what I'm saying and apply it to you. Don't let me do the thinking for you. Use the reason and wisdom God gave you. With that, let's talk about military. U.S. Marine Corps, to where I joined when I was 17, And yes, I was issued a K-bar. Yes, I did carry a K-bar in the war. I also carried a bayonet. Not at the same time, usually, depending on missions. It was not uncommon for me to have that on my plate carrier. The U.S. Marine Corps K-bar has its own long history. We could probably do an entire episode on that. It's essentially a large, was at the time hunting knife, adapted and adopted by the military. Clip point blade It's a great, rugged, and robust design that holds up to the abuse even of United States Marines. A fantastic military knife. Speaking of that, the SOG seal knives were also popular. As were later on, I remember seeing like the Gerber LMF or strong arm, that kind of series for large fixed blade knives. And in a military context, they make a lot of sense. Not worried about concealing them. And you may do any number of tasks that require a large utilitarian fixed blade knife. That being said, even then I had a folding, smaller folding knife in my pocket for a lot of tasks. And also had and carried quite a bit in exchange for that very good K-bar, a smaller fixed blade knife. It was a Gerber. I don't remember the make. This was, we're talking, it was there for the initial ev- invasion of Iraq before we even declared war on them and invaded from Kuwait in 2003. So a long time ago. I don't even know that they make the model anymore, but it was a good size fixed blade knife. High speed back then. It was in a leather sheath that I attached somehow to my body armor with 550 cord before a lot of that tactical Kydex knife sheaths and all that stuff leather sheath that I tied on with 550 cord. It worked well. Pretty good at knots. Even back then, I made some kind of quick detached knot where I could grab it out of my body armor. That's generally how I carried it, on my body armor, so that I could grab it if it need be to get somebody off of me. And it was somewhere between a 3.5 and, and a 5-inch blade, and I think that's fantastic for a good all-around utility defensive knife. The Gerber drop-point blade. It was a good knife. 
And we see this common theme throughout the military, throughout the years, the decades. The K-bar, the bayonet. And bayonets can be useful in a military context. Kind of a good crossover, the M9 bayonet, which is a good utility knife. It's got a saw, it's got a wire cutter. It's a good standalone knife that's also a bayonet. There's many good designs of bayonets, but you see that common theme of a robust, rugged, fixed blade knife in the military. Well, where does that fit in if you are not in the military? I'd say pretty good for a bug out bag, an emergency bailout bag, something where you might want a robust fixed blade knife for any number of tasks. Maybe you have a set of body armor or something like that keep in your truck or keep at the ready that will be a good place for one of these military or paramilitary large fixed blade knives a really good one that doesn't cost a lot of money I should mention is the Glock knife yes Glock makes knives they made knives I believe before they made guns and their knives are pretty well made and robust and really well thought out and not super heavy they're a good design so you may take a look at those for most people, these style of lives are going to be a little bit too big for EDC, CCW, even law enforcement. Maybe they have one on a bailout bag in the trunk or their cruiser or something like that, but they're probably not EDCing a large fixed blade knife the size of a K-bar in law enforcement. Well, let's transition to law enforcement. I was LAPD, regular assignments, more specialized assignments. I'm going to be honest. I often just carried a folding knife in my pocket just a three three and a half inch three to four inch folding knife and why is that well because I often as a police officer carried a backup gun carried whatever my sidearm was Glock 22 or something else and I would also carry a backup gun a J frames Smith & Wesson 38 special somewhere in a pocket on an ankle that changed over the years so I had that. So I already had a backup defensive weapon that I was going to go to if something happened with my primary gun. It was a really hairy situation or one of my more specialized assignments. I'd probably be ha I'd probably have the shotgun anyway. Talking shotgun, then primary sidearm, then secondary sidearm and then knife. So you're getting pretty far down. I'm not saying it was the right choice, but at the time, I'll be honest, I just carried a folding pocket knife. We'll kind of skip over that for now because I'm going to get more into that in the EDC. Because I carried a backup gun. It wasn't as important to me as a fighting tool. And perhaps it should have been, but I want to be honest. But I did often carry one and it got used for daily tasks. And there are a lot of those. That have nothing to do with tactical application. That have nothing to do with martial kind of fighting application. Common knives in law enforcement and first responders that I've seen over the years... The rescue tools, multi-tools, those are not uncommon. A lot of utilitarian stuff. You'll think, a lot of people think of cops as gunfighters. I've said this many times and it probably won't win me any friends, but that's okay. This is coming from a cop who was a cop and who trained. I'm an FBI firearms instructor. I should say I'm an FBI certified firearms instructor. I don't teach for them anymore. But I've taught a lot of law enforcement. I've worked regular assignments, more specialized assignments for the average patrol officer. They are not gunfighters. You see how much time they spend training with their gun, the average one. There are some that go above and beyond and shoot competition on their days off or things like that. But for a lot of them, they shoot when it's qual time, which is on a good department, maybe once a month. If I said, oh, I'm, I'm really into fitness, I'd say, oh, cool, how often do you work out? Once a month. You, you get what I'm saying? Shooting, especially handgun shooting, is also a perishable skill. Yeah, they spend a lot more time administrative stuff and paperwork and in a cubicle than they do practicing their gun handling and shooting because cops aren't paid to be gunfighters right they're paid to be administrators and and that work in that system to take people into custody or write tickets or whatever the case might be it's very rare that police get into shootings thankfully especially we're talking patrol officers not SWAT officers or fugitive recovery or things like that that may up the danger a little bit. But for somebody that's wearing body armor on the outside for a more specialized assignment, it would not be uncommon to see a fixed blade knife. 
Again, rescue tools are also common because I would submit police officers render first aid a lot more than they probably get in gunfights, as much as we don't think of them in that role. But oftentimes, they're the first ones there before EMT, before firefighters. They're often the first ones on the scene. Those kind of aid and rescue tools have a place, I think, in law enforcement. You might want to consider having one of those in your vehicle, in your bailout bag, in your car, however prepared you choose to be. Now, in my time as the commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters, and also going back into my time as a private contractor, this kind of where I start giving more thought, honestly, to the knife as a legit, let's say, contingency plan. I'm talking about, although different roles, I was dressed pretty similarly, a war belt, like a good duty belt, not like a police duty belt, a Sam Brown with polished leather and stuff like that, but a fighting belt that we had a little bit more liberty to configure how we would like. I don't remember what year I settled on this. It was in the military, but not in the Marines. It was in the Army, and I think it even predates that. But for a long, long time, for years and years, and my go-to carry knife, was a Gerber 06 Auto. I do believe the military issues those, but it was never issued to me. I bought one with my own money. It's like kind of the first really upgraded knife. I mean, like really good powdered metallurgy steel S30V. <laughs> Why I wanted one is kind of odd. I was in a store and somebody was handling one and dropped it and went to catch it and it sliced their hand up so bad. I looked at that and said, I kind of want one of those. And I got one, bought it used, used it for years and years and years. Gerber 06 Auto. If you are set on a folding tactical knife, that's going to be my number one recommendation. Gerber makes some really cheap knives. They make some really, really exquisite good knives. This is a good knife. It is an automatic, so if an automatic knife, meaning you press a button and the blade flips out, is a felony in your area, then... Maybe it's out for you, but if that doesn't apply to you, if it's legal in your area, number one recommendation for a folding tactical knife. If it's for straight tactical application, and this is the one I carried for a long time, Tonto. Tonto is not a great crossover blade for lots of different things. It is a good tactical blade. That's kind of where it shines, the American style Tonto. It's good at stabbing. It's good at penetrating. If it's For this kind of knife, I know a lot of people don't like serrations, but for this application, I think partial serrations is just fine. They make all different configurations of this knife, but that American Tonto Partial Serration Gerber 06 Auto, it's a fantastic knife. It's robust. I'd hate to see what you'd have to do to break one. It has a lock. You can lock the blade either closed or open. It's a robust design. You can get an upgraded spring for it, so it really throws that blade out there, which I did to kind of my go-to one that I had for a long time. It's a good size. If that was the only knife that I had, I would probably want a more crossover design. So if you're looking for a more crossover knife, yes, you want a tactical knife for defense, for getting somebody off of you in a hurry. You also want it to be your main knife for a bunch of other stuff. You know, you want to skin a deer with it. You want to cut rope with it. Not that the Tonto won't do that, But just get the drop point design. They make a drop point design. I believe they make a just regular edge and a partial serration. You do you. But it's a great design. It's robust. It's rugged. And for a folding knife, it's pretty quick to get into action. That is a great tactical folding knife. Granted, it is an auto. And they do make versions that are not an auto. So you may look at those if an auto is not legal in your area. Also really popular in this, saw a lot of them around in the communities I was in, the uh, CRKT M16, not the gun, but M16 is kind of the name, and there's all kinds of variations of that. It's been very popular over the years. You'll see that kind of theme in knives that I have chosen. They've been around a while, and there's a lot of variations of them because a lot of people like them because they work. The... M16 is kind of like that, and they have a bunch of different variants of that. Got Tontos, they got more traditional style blades, they have partial serrations, they have all different styles of serrations. Get the one that works best for you. 
This is really not the episode to discuss what different things do on knives. I've done other episodes. Again, go to Alpha Male Podcast and search knives and listen to those. For tactical application, again, I, I think this is a good case for the Tonto. If you're asking me about martial application, any knife is better than no knife if you need a knife. But I would really like, I would say three and a half. Three, three at a minimum, three and a half. And when you get to four and more, it starts getting a little bit too big. So I would say between the three and four inches. You can go bigger if you want, but just make sure you're not leaving it at home. You know, four, four and a half. That that starts to be a pretty big blade. Again, for this application, Tonto is fantastic. You don't need a Tonto. A clip point, a drop point is great. Now, getting back to private contracting, being the commander of a tactical team, those kind of roles with a legit war belt. One thing that I really like in that war belt is a push dagger. I really like push daggers. They have a fantastic martial application. That's kind of where I started thinking about this. We would do a lot of training and ground fighting because a lot of fights end up on the ground and gunfights are no different. If you're only training for what you want to happen, I would submit that's not being a gunfighter. Gunfighting can be a nasty business. A lot of fights end up on the ground, especially if you're the good guy, because you generally have to wait for a reaction, like somebody else is doing something bad, and you have to react to it. If somebody walks up to you, you can't just shoot them in the face. If somebody approaches you at a 7-Eleven and you weren't paying attention and you are kind of stuck there, you can't just draw a gun and shoot them in the face until they show evil intent that rises to the level of the use of deadly force, right? But you know, they can get really close to you, like normal conversational distance. And it's not a large leap, literally or figuratively, for them to be on you and for you to be wrestling on the ground. Same thing in private contracting with civilians, with just who knows what the scenario could be, right? For this kind of application, if you can get to it quickly, a push dagger is a really great tool. I'm going to recommend Cold Steel because I know them. I've used several of them. But there's many other ones. They have a whole variety from, I'd say, practical blade lengths to really, really big blade lengths. I like to keep, this is how I have mine, on my non-dominant side, so the side that didn't carry my primary sidearm, in my war belt. And I would paint the handle to kind of match the aesthetic of the war belt. So unless you really knew where to grab it, you you weren't going to know it was there. It was easy to grab with either hand, but especially with my non-dominant hand. That way I could use it as a get-off-me tool in ground fighting and grappling. If somebody went to grab my gun, I could pin. If you don't know any of these techniques, then kind of a moot point. But if you could pin that gun into your holster with your elbow, you know, leaning down on it with your entire body weight, and then I can grab my push dagger and let's just say aggressively persuade them to do the right thing by letting go of that gun. It's a real thing. A lot of people get shot with their own gun, law enforcement you know, it's, it's not an uncommon thing. That's a great tool to make sure that I can retain control of the things and the tools on my body. Push daggers, if you don't know, are the ones that go between your fingers. And there's a couple of advantages there. If you're familiar, if you've done any boxing, any ground fighting, and you're familiar with throwing a punch, it basically is just a giant force multiplier for throwing a punch. So since you grab around it and the blade is exposed, especially if it's a double-sided push dagger, It's really, really hard to get that blade out of your hand if you're fighting over it. I mean, it's you have really positive control of it, and you don't really have to know any fancy knife techniques. You can literally just throw punches with it. So because of that T-handle, they're fairly easy to grab. So for all those reasons, I think they have a lot of really good application as a, let's say, contingency plan for fighting, especially up-close, dirty, CQB, ground fighting. The push dagger. Actually, if you're wearing a belt, a war belt, or whatever you want to configure that for you. It doesn't have to be in a war belt because I don't know how many people out there in the audience wear a war belt day to day. But for that application, if you have a war belt, I would say you really ought to think about having one in there. And then I would also carry a folding knife in my pocket. Again, Gerber 06 Auto. But this is where I started thinking about this and doing different ground fighting and grappling scenarios. And I started thinking about a fixed blade and carrying a fixed blade as EDC. Because if you're fighting on the ground, 
and you have a window to grab a knife. It may be a small window. You may have opportunity to grab the knife and you may not be able to deploy that knife, especially if you only have one hand because the other hand is otherwise occupied, meaning it's like being pinned behind your back or it's broken or it's shot or you're just laying on it and there's a 200 pound dude on top of you and you can't get to that arm, your dominant arm. There's one reason in general, whether it's a fixed blade or a folding knife, I will carry my EDC knife in my opposite side from my firearm pocket. That way I have a weapon accessible on either side with either arm. Now I can draw either one with either arm. You get the idea there. If I'm laying with my arm pinned under me and my gun is inaccessible or not there or whatever the case may be, out of ammo, with my other hand I can deploy that knife. Getting back to the fixed blade, I might, if I'm one-handed, be able to have the time to grab that knife, but once he sees it, the fight's going to be on. The quicker I can get that knife from stowed wherever it is to in action as a use of force implement whether that's to make space or whatever the case is quicker I can do that really the better that knife doesn't do me much good if I can't get it into action and the more I thought about that the more I started thinking about carrying a fixed blade and I did unless you count like during the war on body armor I'm talking about like in my pocket day to day in addition to professional gunfighting just out and about CCW and that is the Topps Iraq Jack. It is kind of designed, I believe, for this very reason. For ground fighting, getting somebody off of you, or employing deadly force when you can't get to your firearm, or a firearm is not an option. I already had that knife. I had it on my baby bug out bag, my bailout bag, which you'll know I'm, I'm big on if you've listened to this and Alpha Male podcast for a while. It was already on there, so I modified it with an ulti clip. I did it and I clipped it inside my pocket the same place I would carry a folding life, the Gerber 06 Auto. And it clipped into there, and I could literally just grab it and go. It's a good size. It's a good design. It's a good all-around beefy knife, which is why it was on my bailout bag. However, it was a little bit too heavy. If you look at that thing, it's, I want to say overbuilt. It's pretty thick and beefy for a small fixed blade knife. So although I, I like the concept, it was good proof of concept, now that resides back on my bailout bag and the second most knife that I carry I can word that better I mean professional podcaster the knife that I went to next and is still my second most carried fixed blade EDC knife is a Topps Mini Tracker it is a fantastic all around knife and if by all around you're talking all manner of tasks from survival to outdoors to hunting, fishing, survival, and you want it to be a decent defensive option. If you look at it, it's kind of a... Def- well, let's just say if you're not familiar with the Tops Tracker design, it's very unconventional looking. But that doesn't make it not utilitarian and useful. I think it's very utilitarian and useful, so much so that I have a larger version But this is a great EDC knife. Unlike the Iraq Jack, it is much thinner. It's felt. It's really good. It is a really good size. And I carry that much the same way in my support side pocket with an ulti clip. So since I'm big into EDC and preparedness and survival, a whole episode on this, but I'll briefly mention I have on there a small ferrocium rod on some extra cordage. I can undo if I want to wear it as a neck knife if I'm going swimming or bathing in a creek or whatever the case might be. If I just need some extra cordage. Also have some Tinder on there, not the dating app or whatever abomination that is, like to start fires. I have a small aluminum or titanium, I forget what it is, little container that holds water purification tablets. A ranger band to get fire going in really nasty conditions, and a couple of fish hooks wrapped around some fishing line around the ulti clip. And that might sound like a lot, but it really is minuscule doesn't weigh much doesn't take up a lot of space and that rides inside my pocket i can purify water i can start a fire all those kinds of things and that tops mini tracker if you're looking for a fantastic size for a good fixed blade edc knife it's a great one it's pretty unconventional if you're not great at sharpening knives or don't want all the extra features and the swept back blade and the saw 
we might find something similar, which is going to lead me to my next knife, which is the next one I got and the one I've, it's my most commonly carried EDC knife. It is fantastic. It is probably, I think it is for now. If you said I can only have one knife, period, end of sentence, one knife, I'd pick this one for EDC, for survival, for all kinds of things. And that is the White River Firecraft. Now this is made kind of for fire and bushcrafting and survival. Ironically, I got it when I was the commander of a tactical team and I got it mostly for tactical application. I looked at the blade design, I looked at the style, I looked at the size, the weight, I just pulled it out of the sheath and realized I should probably take a little bit better care of it. It's pretty dirty, still very sharp, but the White River Firecraft 3.5, it is probably, again, the one knife I would pick if I could only have one knife. It is fantastic, it is light enough and small enough to be a good EDC option. It's got a very, very useful blade. The 3.5 denotes 3.5 inches. It's a really good size. It's a really good shape. It is robust. It's rugged. It's S35VN. I'm not a super knife steel snob, but I do believe my experience over the years, the premium steels, the 154CM, the S30V, S35VN, they really are a large step up from just regular steels. That being said, that Topps Mini Tracker is 1095, and it's a good steal. But this knife just is a fantastic all-around knife. I have it configured very similarly with the sheath with the multi-purpose functions. It's got a little bit larger ferro rod called the Firecraft because it's kind of designed to start fires. So I have, again, water purification, cordage, fishing hooks, and it rides inside the pocket, and it's light, it's handy. It also has a ring on the back, which is a really good design feature if you're just using it like a regular knife so it doesn't slip out of your hand. It's also really good for tactical applications. A lot of those kind of knives have that ring on the back. I do think that it's useful. And although it was designed for kind of survival and bushcraft, I think it's one of the best tactical EDC fixed blade knives, period. It's a fantastic knife. So let's discuss in the context of being a well-armed citizen, CCW, that kind of context, just day-to-day -day life. I think if you're a man, you should have a knife on you. If you accept that statement as generally true, now you might be at the airport or something like that, but if you accept that statement as generally true, and you carry a gun, likewise see the potential for use of force. Why not have that knife have the additional utility of being used as a defensive weapon as well? Now there's that old saying, don't bring a knife to a gunfight, and I started out in the beginning, why not bring both? There are any number of scenarios where the knife may come out even if you have a firearm. If you've ever done any kind of ground fighting and stuff like that with guns, with blue guns, dummy guns, you'll know, you know it can be hard at times to access a gun if you're wrestling over a gun. A knife can be a good way to quickly persuade said adversary to let go of that weapon. Or if it's just out of action, it's been lost, it's been damaged, destroyed, it's out of ammo, you have a knife. With that being said, I, I must mention that just like a lot of people have been shot with their own guns, you could get stabbed with your own knife. If you have it, that means that potentially the adversary can have it as well. I think this has kind of been overplayed sometimes because there is a risk versus, versus reward analysis for carrying a knife and one that can be used for defense. However, I think if you're already in an altercation use of force, most people aren't going to, most adversaries aren't going to note that you have a clip hanging out of your pocket and that it might be a knife and how it's oriented and where to grab it once you start fighting. But if you train, you should be consistent and carry that knife in pretty much the same place all the time. Blade oriented the same way, quick deployment with the hand that you reach for it with. 
and all that stuff. And I think with all those scenarios, it's more beneficial to have one that can be used for defense than not have it. There is some dissenting opinion on that in the, let's say, tactical community. But I would give serious thought to having a knife you can use dual purpose. And that's basically there are other options, but three main ones. The most common one, a folding knife in the pocket. I would encourage you to think about carrying it in your support side pocket, the side that does not have the gun. You already have a weapon on that side. I would encourage you to think about carrying it on the other side. I would encourage you to look at a useful size blade. You can go smaller, especially if you train, but I would say three to four inches. If there's some kind of legality thing, it has to be under three inches, that's fine. Just do the best you can with what you have. If you want a good all-around best pick for an EDC knife, for all manner of situations, a folding knife, I am really going to recommend, I may sound like a broken record, but the Buck 110 Slim. The Buck 110, one of those knives, again, been around a long time, a lot of iterations. The reason that I prefer the Slim, as the name denotes, it is slimmer. Also, it has a clip, so you can clip it in your pocket you know, consistency. It's oriented the same way every time. Also, it may seem trivial, but it has a thumb stud on the blade, meaning you can open it much more easily one-handed than a traditional buck knife. And traditional buck knives are beautiful heirloom quality pieces, but if you're talking a backup defensive tool or EDC knife, the Buck 110 Slim is going to be my number one recommendation. There are many others. If it's your the most effective folding defensive knife I've had any experience with that's going to be the Gerber 06 Auto. It's quite a bit beefier and more robust. Definitely a more formidable fighting weapon than the Buck 110. The Buck 110 is designed to be a great all around knife, and it is. A Gerber 06 Auto, especially in a Tonto, is a formidable weapon. That's going to be your one thing. And I should, I'm going this out the perspective that you are armed with a handgun, but for some people, they can't be armed with a firearm for whatever reason, just legally, whatever the case is. So think about that in knife selection as well. If it's your one or your main go-to defensive option, really give it a little bit more consideration, I think. Again, I mentioned the M16, the CRKT M16. Those are pretty well-known and proven. They're not expensive. I should mention the Buck 110 Slim going back to that. It has just a basic version which is fantastic. They're not expensive. They make some much more expensive options with premium steel. Get whichever one you want, but they're a good all-around knife. That CRKT M16. Spyderco, the Spyderco paramilitary are pretty popular. I've never owned one. Well, that's not true. I won one in a shooting competition, but I've never actually bought one of the Spydercos. I'll be honest, I just think they're ugly. They're great knives, especially like the paramilitary would fit in this category. I, again, I just don't like the way they look. That's not a knock on their form or function. If you like that style, you like the way they look, then that's a good option as well. And I'm not here to tell you which models exactly. Just in this general arena, like it can be used as a formidable fighting weapon on the folding side of EDC knives. The vast majority of people, I think, are going to carry a folding knife. If you want a super light option, now this is part of my ultralight EDC when I'm out running or, you know, things like that. Two options that are really good for ultralight EDC. And they're still formidable fighting weapons. The only Benchmade that I own is a Benchmade bailout. I got it mostly for this reason. Tactical backup tool. So the bailout is a Tonto blade. It is... 3V, it is crazy light. I'm going to actually look up what it weighs. 2.05 ounces. 2.05. That is light. Well, if you're not currently into carrying a knife, think about the bailout if you're looking for a martial application knife. Two ounces, you clip it in your pocket. I doubt you would notice it. Kind of the point, like I'll clip it into my silkies when I go running. It's a great ultra light knife. That's kind of the big reason I have it. It would also be a great EDC, let's say, backup defensive tool. It's big enough for that, and it weighs two point something ounces. 
Also, if you want a more utilitarian crossover style blade, they make the Benchmade Bug Out. I believe the Bug Out came first. I don't own one, but I can see from the bailout that it would be a fantastic carry option. For just being prepared, EDC, everyday carry, and a good defensive tool. You get into the mini bug out, you're kind of getting a little too small for me, but the regular bug out size would be a decent defensive tool. Not great, but okay, and it's super light. Getting into the fixed blades. I already mentioned, I'll go over real quick again, the Tops Mini Tracker, the Tops Iraq Jack, and there's another one I didn't mention that I carry. I would say it's EDC when I'm out like living off grid in the wild. It's a little bigger than I want to carry every day, day to day, but that's an SE4. It's a big beefy knife. It's a good robust knife. It would be fine in a defensive use, although that's more designed as a survival knife. But since I do sometimes carry it in that roll support side pocket with an ulti clip, I figured I would mention it. This one also has a small saw, a whistle, a compass, in addition to a lot of other things I mentioned on the other knives, and that rides inside the pocket. And the number one pick, like I said, if I could only have one knife, EDC or otherwise. That White River Firecraft is just an amazingly well-thought-out, well-balanced knife. Whether it's for survival, bushcraft, or for tactical application, it's a fantastic knife. My one kind of beef with it is it has one finger groove. I don't like finger grooves. That's just me. I like to be able to use it equally well in a bunch of different kinds of grips. But that said, it doesn't really take much away from the knife. But if I was going to design one myself, I would pretty much do the exact same thing without a finger groove. It's a fantastic knife. That White River Firecraft 3.5. I think 3.5 is the sweet spot for EDC and good useful size. I should mention one that I bought to try out. And it's a good idea. It's a good design. It's not expensive. It would be a nasty, let's say, use of force tool. This doesn't fit with the way that I generally carry. I mean, I can carry it and train with it the same way all the time. And that's the K-Bar TDI fantastic knives there's a bunch of different iterations of them different blade lengths different designs i do believe they have a tanto now these are kind of quasi somewhere between a push dagger and a traditional knife they have kind of like they kind of look like a bent elbow and they're meant to be grabbed and thrust not as good as a push dagger but much in the same way you just thrust with them it directs that force to the point of that weapon without having to do a different kind of grip and I think it's a great design. The sheath is kind of configured to clip on a belt and be worn horizontal on a belt. That's just not how I carry. I already carry on my strong sided gun and on my support side a spare magazine and a tourniquet. And in my support side pocket, generally EDC, a flashlight and a fixed blade knife. So it just didn't fit in. But especially if you're somebody that's going to carry a knife and you can't have a gun... For a good fixed blade knife that's not crazy big, it wouldn't be super hard to carry concealed. If that was my one defensive tool, I would give serious thought to the K-Bar TDI or something like it. It's a fantastic design, and I got it just to kind of kind of T&E the validity of the design when I was looking at carrying a fixed blade. It just didn't fit into what I was doing. That doesn't make it not a great design. I think that it is. And the other thing I should mention, and that I was doing today earlier at the gym, because for certain exercises, I can't have my Buck 110 Slim clipped into my silkies, which is a, a common go-to for me at the gym. For whatever different exercises, I might carry a neck knife. I should mention my wife's kind of go-to defensive tool when she's out running. She's training for a half marathon she's got coming up this weekend. By God's grace, she'll do great. A neck knife. Much like the TDI, there is nothing wrong with neck knives. They're a fantastic option. They just don't generally fit the way that I do things. Because I generally call me old school. I tuck in my shirt. Generally how I still carry is I'll have pants or shorts and I'll tuck in my t-shirt or tank top or whatever. And I'll wear an overshirt like a bone tactical concealed carry shirt, whatever they call it. Just a flannel shirt, depending on environment, right? And I'll have a full-size fighting handgun and my knife and all that stuff concealed by the shirt. I tuck in my inner shirt. 
and that kind of greatly hinders the ability to quickly access a neck knife. If you're the kind of person that doesn't wear a belt or doesn't tuck in their shirt, I think a neck knife could be a fantastic option. You could reach up under your shirt, grab it with either hand. It's a fixed blade knife. I do have a couple. I've done an episode on neck knives. You can check that out. Again, it was on Alpha Male Podcast. I'll mention a couple that I've used. The best one, if it was going to be my only defensive option and it had to be a neck knife, Bone Tactical. I believe it's called the EDC Relentless. It's a fantastic design. It's not crazy expensive. I think it's well worth the money. I think if the sheath alone cost the money that the knife cost, it would be worth it. It's a good knife. It's a good sheath. It's the best defensive neck knife that I own, period. Again, I just don't generally EDC a neck knife. But it's kind of that classic dagger design, a formidable fighting weapon. It's got a really good positive grip for a defensive tool. It's good, if it's going to be your one defensive tool and it's going to be a neck knife, I can't recommend anything more highly than that. It's a pretty skinny double-edged dagger, so it's you couldn't open an Amazon box with it. You could open an Amazon box with any of these knives. If you're talking multifunctional, not so much. It's designed as a fighting weapon. Another one that I have and like, it has a little bit more crossover utility. Not as good a fighting knife, but a decent one, especially for a get-off-me weapon or make-space weapon. The Cold Steel Bird and Trout Knife. Not expensive. Good, good knife. The blade is fairly small, but the handle is fairly large, so you could push it into whatever you were trying to, take that however you want, quite a bit farther than the actual blade length. It's got a fairly small blade and a nice size handle, but it's very sleek, very svelte, and it's got a lot more dual purpose. As the name implies, it's meant for dressing birds and trout. It's a good, all-around useful blade shape, although it's very small, and pretty easy to carry as a neck knife. It doesn't weigh a lot. Again, it's very sleek. And then I have another small CRKT Doug Ritter. It's really small. I mean, the blade maybe, the whole thing maybe is smaller than my thumb. Not a lot of defensive use there, but a good utilitarian neck knife, so I thought I'd mention it. Not great in tactical application. Better than nothing, but not by much. Now my wife's, she carries one of the cold steel push daggers. She carries that generally running under her shirt. But she can reach up under her shirt and grab it if she needs to. It's kind of been her, her EDC out and about running knife since I got it for her. And I'm very happy that she generally carries that and really likes it. And again, they make all different sizes. But for that, just quick, dirty, defensive tool just to get somebody off of you or multiply the amount of force you're able to project. It's a great tool for that. And I thought I might wrap this up taking a look at history. And I'm talking about... I'm kind of talking about looking at knives with this proven track record. And I'm not talking about proven like the 1940s with the K-Bar. I'm talking about a much longer history. Like 20 times longer than that or more. If you look at the Roman Pugio, it's a very classic looking, medium sized, double-edged dagger and it didn't originate with them you see these kind of knives in ancient egypt you see them in you know ancient mesopotamia they kind of pop up in and out throughout history and that has to tell me as a student of conflict for most of my adult life that there is a real merit in that design now this is gunfighter life The knife is a utility tool for me or a backup defensive tool. If it was going to be my one choice, I might look at a design like that because we see it emerge over and over throughout history. So something like the Pugio or the ancient Egyptian daggers, that double-edged classic dagger design, we see it emerge again with the Fairbairn Sykes, a more modern version of that with the Applegate Fairbairn. And... I have some knife fighting experience. I have way, way more gun fighting experience and gun training and all that stuff than knife fighting. If I was going to devote myself to knife martial arts the way I do the way of the gun, then I might give serious thought to that. So if that's you, if you can't have a gun or are not willing to carry a firearm and it's going to be your 
defensive tool, you might give serious thought to something like the that design, the Fairbairn Sykes or Applegate Fairbairn or the Roman Puggio or any kind of design like that. There are other classic designs. Uh, the Karambit's kind of big in culture today, but we really only see that kind of emerge one place in history that I'm aware of, in the Philippines and the Philippine martial arts. Now, if you're acquainted with Philippines and Philippine martial arts, that might be a good place to look. But if you're looking for an all-around, classic throughout history, defensive tool, that Pugio, that ancient Egyptian dagger, Mesopotamian dagger that comes up over and over again, that classic, you know, sleek dagger design. One that gets close and that intrigues me with the knife fighting that I know that's almost like this is the World War II trench knife. I look at it, it's sleek, it's got that same classic handle. It mostly has that double-edged dagger design, except on one side about half of it is sharpened and the other half is flat. That appeals to me with the knife fighting that I know because I can still have a lot of dual utility there and get a assisted stroke, meaning I can put my hand on the back of that blade and shove in and cut really deep. Because I can't do that so much with a completely double-edged dagger. So that one intrigues me. If I was going to devote more time to knife fighting and training, I might give a harder look at that one, although it's probably too big to EDC. That looks to me like a fantastic modern take on that design. Also, on that design, the SOG Pentagon. That one intrigues me as well. It's kind of a modern take with modern steels and good ergonomics on that classic Roman Pugio design. That SOG, I think it's the Pentagon. I'm talking about the fixed blade double-sided version. Again, I have pretty limited compared to gunfighting, knife fighting experience. But there's got to be a reason that we see that very similar design re-emerging over thousands of years. So anyway, just some final thoughts on that. With that, the tactical tip of the day on knives. I mentioned that on my EDC fixed blades, I will generally carry a ferro rod, a ferrocium rod for starting fires, wet, cold, whatever. You may really consider doing that. I mean, as a man, I think you ought to carry a knife and you ought to be able to start a fire. Now, I could I'm sure I could start a fire without a ferro rod. But it's a lot easier than trying to make like a bow drill or trying to find a battery in some steel wool. I'm probably not EDCing a battery in steel wool. Ferro rods, they're fantastic. Talk about simple tech. They're just different elements in a rod. Why not just attach one to whatever manner you want? to your EDC knife, especially if it's a fixed blade. Just attach it to the sheath in a manner that doesn't chafe or something in your pocket. Also, I wanted to clarify some things before we wrapped up. I am not saying that I want this to get skewed, that a knife is a better defensive tool than a firearm at any distance. What I am saying it is it's a situational tool that can be useful in defensive encounters. Now, if you're thinking about a new knife, any of these knives are probably going to cost you more than it's going to cost to sign up on Patreon. Hopefully, you'll see the value of this content that you can get for free, and I want to keep it that way. But hopefully, you'll pay it forward and see the value of the advice, the experience, and want to step up and support the podcast. Again, you can do that by signing up for Patreon. There should be a link in the show notes. That's enough of that. Let's get into important stuff. The tactical verse of the day. Revelation 19.15 Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Remember, whatever knife you choose, far more powerful than any blade, than any firearm, is the sword of the Spirit, which the Bible tells us is the Word of God. Offensive weapon for you as a Christian, as a man of God, in spiritual warfare. As difficult as a actual deadly force fight can be, and stressful 
oftentimes the most difficult battle in life is the battle in our own mind of fights against evil in spiritual ways. The sword for that is the spirit, which is the word of God. So whatever knife you have or don't have, make sure you have, train with, or acquainted with, and know how to use the word of God. Read it. Memorize it. Feed on it like the bread of life and the living water that it is. That, that is a powerful weapon. With that, men, thanks for listening, and have a blessed day.